Shaw's Pygmalion, The Play's The Thing. I'm Jean Reynolds, and this is a presentation from the Shaw in New York conference in October 2015. My presentation is based on a paper that's been accepted for publication in the Shaw Journal. Rather than read the paper to you, I'd like to talk about some issues that came up while I was doing the writing. I'm approaching Pygmalion from a metadramatic perspective, what critic Richard Hornby calls the theater examining itself. When we go to the theater, we expect to suspend disbelief and enter an alternative world that we accept as real. But sometimes, especially in a contemporary theater production, the playwright dissolves the illusion. So we might see rehearsal clothes and a bare stage. Actors might carry scripts, and the director might intrude on the play. The audience might even be invited to become an active part of the show. We're asked to keep ourselves grounded in reality. Critics use the term metadrama to describe that experience and others. You can see why it's a term that's especially relevant to Shaw, who kept wanting to awaken audiences from the illusions and wishful thinking often found in popular literature. Some years ago, I began to suspect that Pygmalion is that kind of metadramatic play. In fact, I'm going to argue that the level of metadramatic awareness we have in Pygmalion is exceptional, even in Shaw. It took me a long time to arrive at those ideas, however. At first, all I had to go on was the first scene in the play, theatergoers heading for home after a show. It's the first sign that this play is different. Instead of losing ourselves in this play, we're going to be getting constant reminders that the theater is different from everyday life. So, right at the beginning of Pygmalion, we know we're not going to get characters that suddenly burst into song and start dancing across the stage. Oops, sorry about that. While I was thinking about all of this, something else in Act 1 began to grab my attention. Higgins's phonetics act. You'll remember that he stages a little magic show. Charles Burst calls it a sideshow. Higgins uses phonetics to guess the backgrounds of bystanders waiting for the rain to stop. Uh, here's a quote from the play. Colonel Pickering. May I ask, sir, do you do this for your living in a music hall? It's clearly a play within a play, which is a dram metadramatic structure, but it's received little attention from critics. At this point, I need to climb into a time machine for a moment and travel back to 1964. That's when I saw Richard Burton in Hamlet on Broadway. I was never the same again, obsessed with both Burton and the play for years. And now the time machine is going to take us to the USF library when I was in graduate school, where I read an essay about Hamlet in Lawrence Danson's book, Tragic Alphabet. It was another I'll never be the same again experience. Danson, and probably but convincingly, argued that the play within a play in Hamlet, called The Mousetrap or The Murder of Gonzago, is hugely important to the play, even though it's usually cut almost beyond recognition. You'll remember that Hamlet is hoping to provoke his uncle into publicly confessing to the murder of Hamlet's father, the former king. Hamlet cleverly has a troupe of actors stage a little play similar to the actual murder. Unfortunately, no public confession is forthcoming. But Danson says that embedded within the player king and queen's lines is a philosophical discussion of the nature of time that's central to Hamlet's dilemma. And I began wondering if Higgins's musical performance might have the same significance in Pygmalion. Something happens there that's central to Henry and Eliza's story. I'll have more to say about this later. I gradually began to have a stronger sense of what sets Pygmalion apart from other plays. During a good production of, say, Arms and the Man, we get lost in the story of Raina and Blunchley until the final curtain call abruptly transports us back to everyday reality. But in Pygmalion, it's the people on stage who get lost in storybooks and make-believe. 
Higgins, for example, gets completely caught up in the Cinderella story that he spins for Eliza, minus, however, a Prince Charming, and the Pygmalion myth that he spins for himself. I've put some of the Cinderella lines onto the handout. When the make-believe ends and Higgins has to deal with the real woman Eliza has become, he's lost. All through the play, Higgins kept hearing warnings about what he was doing, most notably from Mrs. Pierce and his mother, but he never paid the slightest attention. And then I started to think that I was familiar with another play, not by Shaw, where something similar happens. A man who loves the theater begins to act as if he were a hero in a thrilling revenge play. He completely loses touch with reality. But because the real world is much more complicated than melodrama, everything he tries to do goes wrong, and his story ends with a pile of dead bodies. That play is, of course, Hamlet. I think you can imagine what I was feeling at this point in my writing process. Was I really going to submit a paper to the Shaw, arguing that Pygmalion is similar to Hamlet? Luckily, I found an article in the Shaw that backed me up. I've also put this quotation onto the handout. So I was saved. The point I'm trying to make today is, however, different. It's not just that both plays depict a world theatricalized. It's that neither Hamlet nor Higgins can find his way out of the theater to return to real life. So I screwed my courage to the sticking point, sat down at my computer, and started writing my paper. And then I ran into another problem that almost caused me to abandon my project. You may remember Mr. Dick from Dickens's David Copperfield, the hapless writer who kept trying to write a memoir and then had to abandon it and start over, time and time again, because it kept turning into a treatise on Charles I. My paper that I had such hopes for kept going off the rails in the same way. While I was writing about Pygmalion as metadrama, my paper kept trying to argue about who would be the groom at Eliza's wedding, Henry or Freddy. Here's an example. I was interested in how the characters in Pygmalion are affected by various myths, stories, and archetypes. I've already mentioned two of them, Cinderella and Pygmalion. Another was the teacher arch archetype that prohibits romantic relationships with students. Shaw, so often dismissed as psychologically limited, shows a remarkable understanding of this issue. Here's Higgins in Act Two, attempting to ease Pickering's fears that Eliza will be exploited. He and Eliza, he says, are blocks of wood. Full disclosure, I'm not attacking teachers who marry students. I did it myself. That's my wedding picture. Here's a quotation from Pamela Cooper White, a minister and counselor who's written a remarkable article about this archetype. There's a link in the description for this PowerPoint. Clearly Shaw was building an ironclad case against a romance between Higgins and Eliza. But then those barriers come crashing down. In Act 3, the protective power of the teacher archetype begins to fade as Higgins makes Eliza a kind of servant. And then in Act 5, Eliza herself demands the archetypal barrier between herself and Higgins when she says, you're not my teacher now. Score one for the Higgins and Eliza wedding side of the stadium, exactly where I didn't want to go. Clearly I was having a problem controlling my paper. And that started me thinking about Shaw trying to control his play and suffering defeat after defeat, beginning with the very first production in London. The problems with the ending have persisted, and an, an exasperated Shaw finally added an afterword explaining why Eliza married Freddy. But instead of laying the matter to rest, the afterword opened the door to charges that his play was too weak to make that point for him. Then there was the 1938 movie, which ended with Eliza returning to Higgins. 
nor was Shaw able to control Pygmalion from beyond the grave, the case of My Fair Lady. All these thoughts about artistic control started me thinking about Higgins's unsuccessful attempts to control Eliza. Notice that the iconic cast album cover from My Fair Lady gets it wrong with its series of puppets and its idea of control. Finally, I arrived at what I really want to talk about today, the phonetic sideshow in Act 1. Trust me, there's a link. Embedded within the sideshow are some of the major issues in Pygmalion. Higgins' mastery of role-playing and his scorn for it, the contradictions inherent to the theater world, the complex relationship between an artist and his creation. Higgins can't decide whether role-playing is shamming or metaphysical self-realization. The terms come from a talk Shaw delivered in 1895, acting by one who does not believe in it. Higgins despises the artificiality of small talk and the social graces, but Higgins also practices them expertly and he teaches them to Eliza. The sideshow also deals with the nature of theater and art. Higgins is the producer, director, and performer of his impromptu show. He chooses the venue and he stars in the show. There's clearly even a metadramatic element because audience members are also performers. Everything is in Higgins' favor, but as we see, the sideshow is only a mixed success. The crowd applauds Higgins, but they're also suspicious of him. Eliza doesn't understand that she's supposed to be delighted by Higgins' apparent magical powers. She bursts into tears when he correctly connects her to Lesson Grove. The crowd defends her and attacks Higgins. It's a play that's falling apart. Meanwhile, Eliza isn't interested in metaphysics. She has a life to live, and so she decides to make her exit without Higgins and leaving us to sort through our own illusions and find our way at Shaw's behest across the border between reality and make-believe. <laughs>